Good morning. I'm Keith Cole, and I'm the executive director for the Wolf River Conservancy. On behalf of our board of directors and our entire staff, we want to welcome you all here today for our virtual leadership luncheon. We began the leadership luncheons several years ago to recognize and to show our appreciation to our important donors and partners. We hope that next year we'll be able to gather again physically and have our luncheon and offer you a tasty meal to go along with it. You've all been invited here today to be part of this virtual event because each of you play an important role in the continued success of the Wolf River Conservancy. Thank you for that. As a reminder, since 1985, the Conservancy has been delivering on our mission to conserve and enhance the Wolf River and its watershed as a sustainable natural resource. For today, we wanna to acknowledge our presenters, presenting sponsors for this lecture, as well as the lectures we've had throughout the year. Our presenting sponsors are Buckman, and our foundational sponsor is the Crawford Howard Family Foundation. We also wanna acknowledge our corporate benefactors that help us throughout the year, which would include Bank of America, Brother International, FedEx, the Hyde Family Foundations, Griffles Foundation, International Paper, and Ring Container Technology. Our presentation today, as you will hear, will focus on greenways and trails in an urban environment. Many of you in the audience may not be aware that the founders of the Wolf River Conservancy originally envisioned a greenway and linear park through the city of Memphis to support our overall conservation mission. We are excited about the continued progress that we are making in the build out of the Wolf River Greenway through the city of Memphis. And we particularly appreciate the public private partnership that we have with the city of Memphis Parks and Neighborhoods Division, along with Shelby County. Today, I'm pleased to report to you that for 2021, we now have over 18,500 acres of forest and wetlands have been protected. 550 acres added this year alone. While most of the Conservancy's work doesn't always make front page news, we remain steadfast in our mission to deliver on all of our conservation efforts. Because of you and your steadfast support, the Wolf River Conservancy as an accredited land trust remains committed and focused on our mission. And we know how critical it is to preserve our woods, water, and wildlife. This is the heart of our work. In 2021, the Conservancy has successfully met the challenge to do that very thing. We conserved over 500 plus acres, which included the 144 acre donation to T.O. Fuller State Park. We also partnered with the Conservation Fund on other projects during the year. Our educational outreach has remained robust, uh, now offering virtual as well as in-person learning. And through field trips and lectures and classroom experiences, during the year, we have serviced over 2,500 individuals uh, receiving educational outreach from the Wolf River Conservancy. And this year we launched free community programming along different segments of the Greenway. And through doing that, over 650 Memphians representing 21 zip codes participated in different sections of the Greenway for our outdoor programming. This is an exciting time for the Wolf River Conservancy and we appreciate your continued support to help us in our work. But our work is not possible without educated, generous individuals such as yourselves. A little housekeeping, uh, please do not record the event. We are recording it for you. And if you've registered for this event, you will receive a link later where you can rewatch the program or share it at your convenience. Uh, if you do have questions, please submit those in the Q&A feature of the Zoom uh, meeting here today. Uh, Kathy Justice, our Director of Education, will be compiling those questions and she'll present those at the end of the presentation. I'm now pleased to share with you a very important person to the Wolf River Conservancy, uh, a longtime supporter and friend, and that's Lauren Taylor. Lauren Taylor serves as the Vice President of Programs and Learning for the Hyde Family Foundation based here in Memphis, Tennessee. And through her good work, she has helped manage and oversee over $40 million during the years of 2013 through 2017, all to go to support green spaces, parks, and trails through the city of Memphis. And I'm pleased to share with you that included the Wolf River Greenway as well. 
So Lauren, thank you for being here. Thank you for support. I'll turn it over to you. Thank you. Thanks, Keith. Um, it's a pleasure to be here. Hi, everyone. Thanks for being with us today. Um, the Wolf River Conservancy is, is a very important organization to me professionally and personally. Um, I started working with the organization around 2007 when the foundation uh, partnered with the Conservancy in the city to help plan and implement the Wolf River Greenway. It, and it was challenging, rewarding, fun. Um, even when I suffered horrific bug bites from bushwhacking the, the section that would become the trail off of Humphreys or suffered frostbite walking um, on the McLean, future McLean to Hollywood section. But from planning to design, uh, to land acquisition, to construction, I learned a great deal while working with a great staff and board members and amazing consultants. Um, so we at the foundation are very proud of the partnership. And as you know, the work continues today and we're moving closer to the finish line of building out the entire trail, along with a lot of uh, very important uh, wor other work that the Conservancy is engaged in. So today we will hear from Clyde Higgs, the president and CEO of Atlanta Beltline Inc., um, an initiative that has long been an inspiration for the Greenway and Greenway leaders. I've been tracking the project since the early days, and I was actually looking back at some notes from a visit to Atlanta for a Park Pride conference in 2010. And at the time, it's my, according to my notes, only about half of the trail corridor right away had been acquired. And I think portion, you know, some portions of the trail had been built. So in a moment, though, we will hear from Mr. Higgs about the significant progress made since then. Um, as president and CEO, Mr. Higgs leads Atlanta Beltline Inc.'s executive team in providing oversight of the economic development, design and construction, real estate development, housing, procurement, and human resources activities of the organization. He has strong working relationships with private and public partners across the region, state, and nation. Mr. Higgs has more than 20 years experience in economic development, real estate, intellectual property, technology, strategic planning, design, real estate development, grant and donor funding, and government relations with a diversity of projects, including those that specialize in urban innovation, science, and technology. He joined ABI in 2015 from his position as Executive Vice President of Operations and Development for the North Carolina Research Campus, um, which was a multifaceted or is a multifaceted redevelopment initiative that uses the recruitment of science and technology companies as a platform to uh, redevelop and reinvigorate Kannapolis, a former textile town near Charlotte. Um, and as the top executive of that project, he helped steer the day-to-day -day operations of a multi-billion dollar revitalization effort involving the economic revitalization of the local economy. And before joining the, the NC Research Campus, Mr. Higgs served in various technology-based economic development leadership roles. So we have a lot to learn from him. Mr. Higgs, thanks for joining us today. I very much look forward to learning from you. So I will turn it over to you. Thanks. Thank you, Lauren, for, uh, for that kind introduction. And uh, so, and also Keith and team, thank you for, for making uh, giving us this platform just to talk a little bit about the, the Atlanta Beltline. We are super excited uh, about uh, this project. And, and again, it, it's always humbling that, that the people even want us to talk about what we're doing. We are so uh, tunnel vision on what we're doing in Atlanta. And so it's, it's always, uh, always feels good to hear that people appreciate what we do beyond uh, our great city. And uh, so we're going to throw up the, the slides here and and uh, my team member, Jenny Odom, uh, who is in our communications group, is going to help me uh, drive a little bit here. But uh, we'll go on to to the next slide. And, and, uh, and I think uh, this uh, this next slide that you will will see is is very instructive to to the conversation that we're going to, to have today. And, uh, and so uh, don't know if uh, many of you, you know, follow the New York Times, uh, you know, I do on, a, on occasion. And, and roughly about four and a half years ago, uh, the New York Times, you know, came down to Atlanta, you know, hearing all of this hype about uh, the Atlanta Beltline. And um, 
was just an interest conversation, had a number of conversations about, uh, about the Beltline with uh, community leaders, residents, and uh, even naysayers, uh, if you will, to, uh, to write this, uh, this article about the, the Atlanta Beltline. And if you look at this slide here, uh, here to, to the left, it basically decide, you know, described us as a glorified sidewalk uh, and a path to transform Atlanta. And, uh, and so, so even though, you know, a glorified sidewalk uh, to some may be a pejorative statement, um, and th this, this really, this headline belies, you know, truly the, the article and what they described about the Atlanta Beltline, because we really are a comprehensive redevelopment project within the city of Atlanta uh, to give our residents uh, transportation options to get around the city. And so, so I, I'd love to, to share this, uh, this, this headline because again, it comes off perhaps as a negative statement, um, but when you really drill down to what we are at the Atlanta Beltline, we are so much more. And we'll go to the next slide and this gives uh, a really good snapshot about the, the project. And so, uh, the Atlanta Beltline and and what and kind of who we are, we are uh, roughly a 50 person uh, team that is charged with advancing uh, the Beltline project. Uh, it is going to be over a four and a half billion dollar initiative when it's all said and done. Um, but just a little bit about our history. Um, Atlanta, uh, for those and I'll ask you a, a quick uh quick uh, question here you can answer in the the chat but what was the name of the city of atlanta before atlanta and and so so i'm sure those uh, are that are on chat i, I want you to shoot me a note to, to tell me the answer but but i'll give you a little hint here i'll, I'll give you the, the answer but it's actually called terminus so uh, atlanta is blessed uh, with uh, existing railroad corridor within the city of Atlanta. So we uh, were the site for four abandoned railroad lines within the city. And there is an individual, his name is Ryan Gravel. Ryan gets uh, a lot of the credit for uh, synthesizing this idea about reusing uh, these mostly abandoned railroad corridors to create this loop uh, within the city where again, people had transportation options to, to get around uh, the city of Atlanta. Uh, Atlanta, as you know, is uh, a significant uh, commerce city within the Southeastern United States. And uh, that causes all sorts of uh, traffic challenges for us. And so any ideas that we can uh, think through that helps, to, to, helps us to get around the city in different ways, uh, is often embraced uh, within within our city ranks. Uh, but just a little bit about the, again, the project. Ultimately, the Beltline will connect 45 distinct neighborhoods within the city of Atlanta. That, that's significant in itself. And if we think about what infrastructure perhaps did in the past by uh, separating communities uh, and, and residents, the Beltline is now using infrastructure as, to, as a way to reconnect, uh, again, these 45 neighborhoods in a way that, that we've never seen. And so very excited about that point about our project. From an acreage perspective, uh, the Atlanta Beltline captures about 15,000 acres within the city and which represents roughly about 22% of the city's population. So just to kind of give you a uh, scale here. We'll go to the next slide. And so this, this slide that you'll see here is, is an interesting cartoon and it really represents uh, us as a project. And so oftentimes the, the Beltline Trail uh, gets most of the headline. It is decidedly, you know, perhaps the, the star of the show uh, in many people's minds. Um, but if you really think about what we are charged with, it is significant. So obviously the trail component. And uh, so we are building a 22 mile uh, trail network uh, within the city of Atlanta. Uh, but on top of that, we are also going to have 22 miles of 
of transit, light rail transit uh, within the city of Atlanta uh, surrounding the, the Beltline. And there will ultimately be crosstown routes uh, of that transit within the city. And so we're working closely uh, with MARTA, which is our transportation uh, authority within Metro Atlanta to make this happen. And so in 2016, uh, the voters within the city of Atlanta advanced uh, a new sales tax that will generate over $3 billion specifically for the transit uh, component uh, of, of, uh, of the Beltline. And we will have roughly a billion of that specifically on this, uh, on this Beltline loop that you see in front of you. And then beyond that, and I really have to give a big shout out to the framers of the Beltline. They really thought about this in a comprehensive way. So not only we're we going to develop this 22 mile loop uh, within the city, um, but we're also thinking about housing affordability. And, uh, and so if you have not read about the Beltline, anytime we deliver a new segment of trail, it becomes perhaps uh, the most uh, aggressive real estate market surrounding uh, the Beltline uh, segments. And so obviously this is going to create uh, significant pressures around housing affordability. And so the Beltline uh, as an entity is also responsible for facilitating the creation of 5,600 units uh, of affordable housing uh, by the end of 2030. Uh, we're roughly halfway there right now. But that is a strong topic within the, the city of Atlanta right now and has been for, for at least the, the last uh, six years. And so the Beltline is intimately involved in helping to create uh, those new units. Uh, and then a part that really gets me uh, particularly excited because I'm an economic developer by, by training is that we are also responsible for the facilitation of 50,000 permanent jobs to be created around the, the Beltline Loop by the end of 2030. And, uh, and we are outperforming uh, on that side. You know, we are roughly at 23,000 jobs that have been created uh, around the Beltline, and we've only built eight miles of, tra of trail so far. And uh, so that's something that continues to, to prove out. And then we're also charged with uh, at least $10 billion of private investment along this, uh, this Beltline loop. And so right now we are tracking uh, roughly uh, $8 billion of follow-on investment uh, around the, the Atlanta Beltline. And, and so again, we, we have put roughly $700 million uh, into uh, the Beltline to date. And again, we've seen uh, about $8 billion of private investment follow us. And so getting this 10 to 11 one uh, return on public investment uh, is significant. And then beyond that, we are also uh, advancing public art uh, along the Beltline in areas that are close to us. <clears throat> 1,300 uh, acres of new green space uh, within the city and close to the Beltline. Uh, and then also uh, we're responsible for uh, at least uh, 1,100 uh, acres of environmental cleanup. And so again, when you start thinking about the, the Beltline, you know, our trail component, you know, is decidedly, you know, the star of the show, but we are so much more than, than the trail that uh, the people often talk about. And so we'll go to, to the next slide. And so I'm going to blow through a number of these slides so we can leave plenty of time for, for Q&A. Um, but this is something that I touched on uh, earlier in my conversation with you is that we are going to extend uh, light rail streetcar uh, directly from downtown Atlanta uh, to and on the Beltline. And so we are working collaboratively uh, with, uh, with MARTA and making that happen. Uh, we think that we're going to have the first uh, uh, segment of light rail transit on the Beltline within the next six to, to seven years. And again, working closely with the city of Atlanta uh, and MARTA to make that happen. Go to the next slide. And, and this is also something that, that we don't talk about often, but is really uh, important to, to the Beltline mission. And that is, you know, 46 miles of improved streetscapes 
uh, within the city of Atlanta. And so that's something that, uh, that we are heavily involved with. Again, we have uh, a full team uh, within Atlanta Beltline that thinks about these, uh, these items on a regular basis. We'll go to the next slide. And, and this is the, the trail component uh, that I made reference to. Technically, it is 22 miles of trails that we are responsible for. But if you can include the 11 or so miles of spur trails that, that, that we also facilitate, uh, it comes up to, to about 33 miles of new trails within the city. And, and this is an interesting map for you to look at. So if you look at green, uh, that represents the, the number of, of trails that we have completed uh, to date, which is roughly about eight miles. Uh, you can see in the purple, uh, the type of uh, segments that are actually under design and pretty close to being construction ready. Uh, and then you can see the, the blue dotted line uh, at the top of, uh, of, this, of this slide. This represents uh, the Northwestern segment uh, of the belt line. We're still studying that uh, right now, but that's almost four and a half miles. And that is going to be the most challenging, technically the most challenging uh, segment of belt line for us because that is the one segment uh, where there is not existing railroad trail or, or corridor for us to, to pull up. So we have to be very uh, thoughtful in going through certain neighborhoods uh, to really acquire the land so we control, and Lauren, you mentioned the last time you were visiting Atlanta, we controlled roughly about half uh, of the land that we needed to complete the, the belt line. So we are roughly about 80% of the land that we need uh, right now. But this segment uh, in blue, the dotted lines, uh, those remain as the um, kind of the, the remaining segments that we need to, uh, to acquire to complete the entire loop. Go to the next slide. And, and again, words are woefully inadequate to really describe uh, the Atlanta Beltline. It's one of those things that you literally need to come to Atlanta and visit to really understand what the, what the magic is. And, uh, but what we're gonna try to do is show you some before and after slides, but th this is uh, the East Side Trail before the Beltline. Uh, came to fruition, and we'll go to the next slide to, to show you an after um, the belt line. And so, so th this is uh, hopefully a pretty uh, powerful slide for you, but, but the East Side Trail is uh, arguably one of the top attractions within the city of Atlanta. Uh, just on an annual basis, we see uh, more than 2 million uh, unique visitors that uh, that go up and side, up and down the uh, the, uh, the East Side Trail, the Atlanta Belt Line, uh, on an annual basis, and uh, and this has provided you know, really the foundation for a lot of businesses that are deciding to locate their offices, their presence right on uh, the Belt Line segment where their employees can walk to work, uh, walk back home, uh, get on a bicycle. This is, and again, I, I'm biased here, uh, but please fact check me, but, but th this is truly uh, the place to be from, from a new office location perspective. Uh, there have been some significant announcements uh, along the, the Atlanta Beltline. Uh, Microsoft, a company that we're all familiar with, uh, just decided uh, to buy another or a new 90 acres of land uh, near the Atlanta Beltline, that they will have a new uh, Microsoft campus. They will have thousands of employees uh, right off of the Beltline in a MARTA station. And, and partly the reason why they're making these decisions are because uh, their workforce and the people that they are trying to attract uh, to their company, young people love the Beltline. And so uh, it is a really good marketing tool for Microsoft and other companies to say that we're located off the belt line because uh, there's going to be just a number of people that are going to want to opt into to working there by being off of the belt line. Go to the next slide. And so, so these are just a, a couple of snapshots 
uh, on the on the trail. Uh, you can see the the one in the middle uh, represents the the East Side Trail. You can see kind of the the core ten uh, uh, steel uh, beams that are going up out of this specific picture. And in the background, uh, you will see a really interesting facility. So if you have a chance to come and visit uh, Atlanta, you know people are probably going to tell you to go and stop at Pont City Market. Uh, Pont City Market is a incredible facility, an adaptive reuse. It used to be uh, an old Sears and Roebuck um, storage uh, facility from the 1920s uh, that is now repurposed into, again, probably uh, the hottest you know, real estate facility within the city of Atlanta. It is perhaps getting the highest rents uh, from an office perspective. Uh, within the entire city. So that includes Buckhead, Midtown, uh, uh, Pont City Market is, is, a, is an aggressive from a, from a real estate perspective. And that this is the same developer that also developed Chelsea Market uh, in New York City right off the high line uh, there. But it's just interesting to see uh, just the, uh, the magnet that that has become for, uh, for office users, for residential users, and from a retail perspective, um, it is something that uh, uh, that the city uh, of Atlanta residents enjoy on a regular basis. Go to the next slide. And and so th this is a, a park, and uh, perhaps uh, this is interesting to this group listening. But but uh, our par parks perhaps don't get uh, all the shine that they deserve uh, as a part of the responsibility. Uh, of the Atlanta Beltline, but this is a, a really uh, good example uh, here of a park that we developed uh, right off the Beltline. Um, it's this is uh, the D.H. Stanton uh, Park that uh, that we're uh, that we're excited about. Go to the next next slide, and this is hopefully another instructive uh, slide for you to view. So this is the old uh, Fourth Ward Park. Uh, before the belt line came in, and then we'll show you two additional slides. And this is kind of what uh, it looks like uh, to date after uh, the belt line came in and redeveloped this site into, into green space. And what you can also see uh, in this slide is a number of multifamily uh, apartment developments that have popped up. Uh, around this. And this is exactly what we want. We want uh, the density and because ultimately this is going to support uh, our transit ambitions uh, along the belt line. We'll go to the next slide. And this is another before uh, picture of the historic Fourth Ward Park area. And you can see uh, again in the background, that was the, uh, the old Sears and Roebuck uh, facility that uh, that Jamestown uh, ultimately purchased and redeveloped. And then you can see the after photo of kind of what it looks like uh, today. And so this is that same uh, picture and what uh, the existing conditions of uh, the historic Fourth Ward Park look like uh, after Beltline development. And again, don't let my monotone style belie how popular uh, this uh, this uh, this uh, feature is. And again, you can see the number of apartments uh, that have popped up uh, along this because it has become a magnet uh, for for development uh, after we come and and uh, and advance the belt line there. Go to the next slide. And then also uh, mentioned earlier, we're responsible for over a thousand acres of environmental cleanup and remediation. We have been very successful in working with, uh, with EPA uh, and our own state uh, version of that to, to clean up uh, a lot of the, the dirty soil. Uh, again, what we're doing from a Beltline perspective, it's right off uh, existing or, or abandoned railroad corridor. So you can imagine uh, all the challenges uh, there. Go to the next slide. And public art. And uh, so on an annual basis, uh, we uh, open up an RFP 
and we allow artists from across the country uh, to submit uh, their pieces to the Beltline. And, uh, and we have one of the largest uh, public art exhibits, uh, at least in the Southeastern United States, perhaps uh, the entire country. And we expend significant resources to make that happen. And, uh, and this is just a smattering of, uh, of some of the art pieces uh, that you might see along the Beltline. Some of those are performance, uh, some of those are pieces that you'll see uh, in, in underpasses, uh, but this is something that is truly enjoyed uh, by, by the city of Atlanta. Uh, and then the conclusion of this is something that we call uh, the Atlanta Lantern Parade. And uh, so before COVID, uh, as our gift to, to the city, we would host uh, this Lantern Parade and again, before COVID, we had roughly 70,000 people that would come out with their handmade lanterns uh, at nighttime and walk the, the belt line. It is a very festive time. So, so almost think about a very family-friendly uh, Mardi Gras, and that's kind of what you have on the belt line, and that, that just continues to grow uh, on, an, on a yearly basis. Next slide. And, and this is a compelling piece as well. So, so when people talk about the belt line, again, I think they lovingly talk about the, the trail piece, uh, but this job creation uh, component uh, of our responsibility is, is significant. And uh, again, um, we think we're going to have about 50,000 permanent jobs uh, that have been created along the, the belt line by the end of 2030. And uh, we are already uh, at about 23, uh, 23,000 permanent jobs that have been created uh, to date, uh, and plus another almost 50,000 construction jobs that have been uh, created uh, because of the Beltline as well. Go to the next slide. So I, I talk about all these, uh, these moving pieces uh, about the Beltline and, and kind of what we do. Um, but it has also created a number of challenges from a displacement perspective. And, uh, and that's why, again, I have to give a, a big uh, a shout out and acknowledgement to the framers of the Beltline uh, because and I'm just being fully honest, no one predicted that the Beltline would be this significant of a success from, from an economic development perspective. And so it has created some pressures from affordable housing uh, situation, and then also making sure that that our businesses that have been in those communities uh, for a long time can also uh, thrive and exist when the belt line comes through. We'll go to the next slide. And so, one of the things that that our economic development team is engaged in is working specifically for for those businesses that have been in those communities for for a long time and providing. Uh, specific support. So as the Beltline is coming through, uh, that they have resources available to them where, again, they can uh, thrive in place and take advantage of the Beltline and not get um, uh, sweeped up in the whole uh, aggressive real estate market uh, that we tend to create as we build out. Go to the next slide here. And, and this is hopefully an instructive slide to you as well. So I mentioned earlier in the, in the discussion that we are responsible for the creation of 5,600 units of affordable housing, either created or preserved. And, uh, and this is just kind of a snapshot of where we are today. So we've uh, created or preserved, you can see this number on the right of the slide, uh, a little more than 2,500 units of affordable housing. Uh, and this is how we count against the, the 5,600 unit goal. But just generally near the belt line, there's also been another 1,700 units of affordable housing uh, created. And so th this is a, a really important slide. Uh, a number of projects across the country and even you know, in the high line in New York City, you know, one of the things that, uh, that they realize is that um, the opportunity to think about the High Line, even as a comprehensive redevelopment tool, was one of the things that they missed. Uh, they thought they were just building the High Line and they can do that in isolation without thinking through the potential community impacts. And, uh, and that's where they really give us high remarks in really thinking about this comprehensively. 
go to the next slide. And so we have also worked with our sister organization. We literally created a, a fund. So as the Beltline goes through what perhaps may be described as uh, more uh, financially challenged you know, areas, uh, the Beltline is coming through and automatically uh, it, uh, it rises or you know, increases the property values uh, of those homes um, in those areas. And so you can imagine if there is a senior citizen or someone that is on a fixed uh, income that was maybe paying, you know, thirty dollars a month in property taxes, and all of a sudden when the belt line comes through, uh, her property, you know, value increases significantly, and that thirty dollar a month uh, property uh, bill turns into three hundred dollars a month, and so. Uh, we've created this fund where we will actually pay the difference uh, in those property taxes. And what are that differences? We then extend that to, to the homeowner. And that's just one of the displacement mitigation tools that we have in front of us. And a number of our partners like Bank of America, Georgia Power, uh, just to name a few, have, uh, have opted into that fund. And so we can think about affordable housing and the displacement pressures uh, in a holistic uh, way. Go to the next slide. And in thinking about affordable housing, uh, again, we have been, been blessed with a significant affordable housing budget uh, over the last fiscal year. We have literally tripled our land holdings for housing affordability uh, over the last uh, two years. And uh, we actually bought a 31 acre site uh, not far from the new Microsoft campus that I made mention of uh, a little bit earlier. And, uh, and that will be a site that we will then uh, erect affordable housing and you know, a mixed use development not far from there. But the, the area that Microsoft purchased in is very non-traditional. I'll just say that as, as a euphemism. Uh, where they purchase is in the Bankhead area, not Buckhead, but Bankhead. And um, as soon as Microsoft made that announcement, uh, property values uh, increased significantly. Um, and all of a sudden, you have now uh, $500,000, $600,000 uh, townhomes that are going up. And just trust my comments here. Five years ago, you would, you would have not had $500,000 townhomes uh, in Bankhead. Um, that, that just wasn't uh, the case there. Go to the next slide. And just a little bit about uh, who we are as an organization. Uh, Atlanta Beltline, Inc., we were created by the city of Atlanta. Uh, we are a separate uh, not-for-profit entity. And uh, so I report to a nine-member board of directors, and we were created specifically to advance uh, the Beltline project. And we work very closely with our Economic Development Authority, Invest Atlanta, um, the city of Atlanta, Fulton County, and the public school system. And we get our baseline funding from our tax allocation district. Some call it a TAD or call it a TIF rather in other states. And, uh, but Fulton County, the city of Atlanta, and, and Atlanta public school systems are quote unquote, our investors, and, uh, and just our baseline funding from, from the TAD uh, was roughly about $60 million uh, last year. And then we get uh, funding from the philanthropic community. Uh, we also get significant resources from the federal government and, and state government uh, as well. Go to the next slide. And, and so th this is a really inter interesting slide here. This is a, a good sampling of the people that, uh, that work uh, at the, the Beltline. Um, but again, we, we consider ourselves to be the quarterback of the Beltline project. There are a number of organizations within the city, uh, be it parks and rec, uh, planning, watershed management, uh, that all help us to advance this project. And so, so I don't want to to come and give you a presentation to think that we do this in isolation. It really is in partnership with a number of, of organizations within the city. Go to the next slide. And I wanna share just uh, before I wrap up here, just a couple of uh, 
of items that uh, were historic for us. And so, um, again, we are funded on uh, property tax values. And so you can imagine what happened during the Great Recession uh, with our funding. Uh, between 2008, 2012, 2013, uh, our uh, income and revenue for Beltline was just um, not significant at all. And so now that the economy is proving out, you know, our revenues are starting to, to increase significantly. And, um, but we go away um, in 2030. And, uh, and so uh, we have to figure out a way to play catch up off of that four or five years of missed revenue that we weren't collecting during the Great Recession. And, uh, and so with the leadership of the mayor and city council, they advanced uh, a new uh, property tax uh, increase around the belt line that you see here in, in the pink. And so, so one of the things that we are blessed with is this really strong community uh, support. And so you had property owners uh, that went to the mayor, that went to city council and said, we are willing to uh, tax ourselves an additional millage so that the belt line can play catch up and actually finish the loop uh, by, by 2030. And so in March of this year, city council and the mayor passed uh, this new assessment we call the, the SSD, the special service district. And what this will do, we will bond against the revenue collected here and we will pull forward about a hundred million dollars of revenue uh, that literally will hit our books uh, this month and, and that is the most significant development in, in our history. So whenever you know, the next historian writes the, the next book about the Atlanta Beltline, what happened in March of, of this year will be the main thesis of that book. That's how significant it was. And what this $100 million SSD did for us, it also unlocked a firm fixed commitment from the philanthropic community of a hundred additional million dollars for for belt line completion. That, that is game changing for us. We have never had that type of infusion of revenue in, in belt line history. And so if you don't remember anything about the, uh, all of my slides, just know that this SSD was pivotal uh, to, to belt line in our development. The next slide here. And again, th this is just a, another map, just depicting kind of where we are uh, in the construction of the belt line. We're roughly at eight miles and we have another 15 miles to, to go to build out. And we think we can complete that by the end of 2030. Let's go to the next slide. And, and these are just uh, additional slides of what we're doing, just uh, additional capital improvements. We're creating some soft shoulders uh, off of the trail and our joggers uh, really appreciate that and go to the next slide. And, and this was significant for us earlier uh, this year as well. So we opened up a new segment of Beltline Trail on the south side portion uh, of town. And this is uh, an area what we describe as the Pittsburgh community uh, that has not seen significant investment within the city of Atlanta uh, for a while. And this was a community that went down in infamy uh, during uh, the housing bus and a lot of the, the challenging or challenge uh, home loans. Uh, this part of Atlanta uh, was really challenged and, and was still playing catch up even uh, in a strong economy. Uh, this area has not seen uh, investment in a while. We'll go to the next slide. And this is just a depiction of where that is located. And so if you think about the, the belt line as a loop, uh, this is roughly uh, seven o'clock uh, on the dial. And, and this investment really set us up nicely uh, for a grant that we went after from the, the federal government. Uh, we just see, received notification that we received an additional $16.5 million from US Department of Transportation to help support the additional build out of the Southside Trail. And uh, again, just game changing for us. And I think we get high marks because we were thinking about the belt line holistically and, uh, and we are developing this in a very equitable manner. And, uh, and just that is really the marching orders from the federal government right now about infrastructure 
and, and using this as, as an equitable development tool. Let's go to the next slide. And this is the conclusion of the formal presentation. Uh, and hopefully, uh, Keith, others, we will have some time for, for Q&A, but, um, but I am all ears if there are any specific questions out there. Thank you so much, Clyde. That was a wonderful uh, presentation. I am uh, going to handle the questions. We have uh, three so far. The first one is how helpful both financially and physically have the city and state been on the Atlanta Beltline? Yes, um, the city has been incredible. Again, we, we were created by the city specifically to, to advance uh, the Beltline. And out of that, that 63 or $60 million uh, annual allocation uh, that we received, uh, the city of Atlanta is one of the investment partners in that, along with uh, the county government and also the school system. You know, kind of the deal is that we will essentially approve, improve these uh, abandoned corridors that were not really on the tax rolls in a significant way. And then the Beltline will come in, clean it up and, uh, and put it back into to the market. And then when we go away, you know, the school system Fulton County and local city government will then have all of those new taxes and that new value going directly into their coffers. That, that is kind of the deal structure. Okay. Um, can you elaborate on the components needed over time to build multi-generational wealth? Yes. Um, with, uh, with our outgoing mayor, um, this was a really important piece of, uh, of her platform. And, uh, and that was making sure that, that as Atlanta continues to enjoy uh, all of this new wealth creation, uh, that, that everyone in the city of Atlanta can, uh, can benefit from that. And, uh, and so, so part of our uh, thrust within the Beltline is, is this job creation uh, piece. And so when we talk about the 23,000 jobs that have been created along the Beltline, we are being very intentional about targeting you know, specific neighborhoods and communities and making sure that they have access to those jobs that pay uh, a, a livable uh, wage. And, and these are jobs that don't necessarily all require a PhD or a master's degree to qualify for them. And, uh, but jobs that also um, you can go to the lo local technical college or get some specialized training uh, over a short period of time and then, you know, have a, a job uh, waiting for you after, uh, after that study. And so, so that is actually a part of our responsibility. And we work closely uh, with, with our workforce agencies to really attract jobs uh, that are going to be beneficial to, to those residents. Uh, in that neighborhood, because I'm sure you have read uh, a lot of the headlines about Atlanta, and we are very proud of the Microsofts and the Googles, the Airbnbs, the Black Rocks, the McKinsey's, all of these high-flying uh, brands out there that are bringing thousands and thousands of jobs uh, to the city of Atlanta. And uh, But what we are trying to do is also make sure there's a good uh, mix of job types around the Beltline where again, you know, residents that may not have, you know, an advanced degree, uh, but they may have a, a GED and, and some specialized training from, from our local community college. We're making sure that we're being very intentional about bringing some of those job opportunities specifically to those, those residents as well. Because I, I can talk about affordability all day from a housing perspective, but you also have to think about helping households generate wealth at the end of the day. And there's also a small business component uh, to that as well, where we are being very intentional about uh, working with impacted communities and helping them to start businesses and grow businesses specifically along the Atlanta Beltline. Because again, if you think about, you know, the 2 million plus visitors that we have on the trail, uh, the businesses that, that are proximal uh, to that traffic, they are winning in a really specific way. And so now it's our job is to make sure that we're spreading out the wealth 
uh, to folks that that don't typically have access you know, to that type of traffic and making sure that they get uh, opportunities to be uh, off of the belt line. Okay. Um, does the extra tax and the SSD impact the low to moderate income residents that you were trying to keep in the corridor? Yeah, so, so, the, so the SSD uh, tax is for uh, commercial properties, and, but it also includes commercial multifamily. And so one of the things that we honestly had to have a real debate about is you know, you know obviously you know the big property owners that uh, that own office space and retail space um, that that is perhaps a, a less concern. But what about the property owners that have multifamily uh, apartment developments, and what will this new tax do uh, to them? And and again, it, it was a robust conversation that we had to have publicly. Um, but ultimately, you know, running the numbers, you know, what this ultimately means just from uh, from a, from a cost perspective if those apartment owners decided to pass this tax uh, on to to some of their residents uh, it meant uh, on the low end uh, about two dollars a month increase if if there was a uh, a passage of those tax to the residents uh, upwards to to sixteen dollars uh, a month um, to uh, potential uh, residents uh, as well. And so that, that was, uh, again, a, a very calculated um, thought process that we had to go through. And again, we were challenged on this. And, but ultimately, I think there was enough strong support uh, to make sure that completing the belt line and, and that type of uh, hit from a top property tax perspective uh, was was worth uh, the investment there, but but again that that was a robust conversation. Uh, I would say over a forty five day period, uh, we hosted about thirty public meetings uh, within the city to talk about those very things. Uh, because again, I, I probably gave you the the end result of that hundred million dollar uh, SSD district, but but the the number of real deep, hard conversations we had uh, did not show up in the presentation there. All right. Uh, what are some of the most popular features along the Beltline? Yeah, I, I would definitely say um, it is uh, obviously just being you know, on the trail itself, uh, but Pot City Market uh, is, a, is a notable development uh, there that um, a very good cross section of Atlanta uh, really enjoys uh, that development. And again, Atlanta, we love our old buildings for the most part. And uh, so that represents a, a wonderful example of an adaptive reuse that is, again, um, arguably uh, one of the most significant real estate developments within the city. Uh, They're mixed use. And, uh, and lots of people enjoy that. Then you also have uh, Krog Market um, as well off of the East Side Trail. Um, uh, you also have another uh, significant uh, development. Uh, the newest uh, park uh, on the city's role is West Side Park. And, uh, and so this is uh, the largest park. So this, um, uh, it's bigger than Piedmont Park for those that are familiar with it, but it's you know close to 300 acres of a new green space, and we also uh, have about a 30-day water supply within this park. And you can see this; it's literally right above me in this little green section uh, behind me. Uh, but this was a significant undertaking uh, by by the city of Atlanta, and it is enjoying. Uh, lots of uh, visitation uh, to that area. And so that was just phase one of the park. There'll be a number of phases to, to increase and improve uh, the site, but it is absolutely stunning from a green space perspective. Um, but again, the, the balance there, because th this was in a neighborhood um, where you, you did not have million dollar homes and, and lots of investment and now that this park uh, is in place, we are have, 
having to be very intentional about the surrounding neighborhoods, the Grove Park area, and, and so forth about making sure that, that those residents that have been there for, for a long time uh, have the opportunity to, to remain in place now that this new uh, feature uh, is there right off the belt line. And just south of this park is, is uh, the new Microsoft or where the new Microsoft campus will be. So the number of investment that is coming uh, near that park, um, Again, if, uh, if you have me back, I'll come and share some of the numbers with you there. But, um, but the city of Atlanta as a whole is just seeing this significant uh, resurgence of, of activity within the city's core. And even beyond the typical uh, development spine of Atlanta, which is you know, Buckhead at the north, Midtown and Downtown, what you are starting to see is this bowing out of non-traditional places within the city of Atlanta where business and industry are, are selecting. And in large part of that is because of, of the Beltline. And, and again, you know, when we first got with the, the Microsoft um, announcement, um, most Atlantans would assume like, okay, they're gonna be in Buckhead or Midtown. And, uh, but they decidedly selected a, a place right off the Atlanta Beltline and th this is very non-traditional. And so, um, so again, we're enjoying uh, a lot of that activity, but it, it is the balance there of, of all this new development of green space, office space, apartments, uh, infrastructure, and, but still making sure that it, Atlanta uh, has a, an interesting mix of residents uh, there in these communities. Okay. I want to tell you and everyone that it's 1259. Would you, do you think you want to take one more question? I would be happy to take another question. Okay. Is the Atlanta Beltline solely responsible for operations and maintenance of the trail? That's, that's, a, that's such a great question. You, you all clearly uh, know your, your trail pieces here. So it, it's, um, it's interesting. We, we are uh, the organization that deploys our TAD dollars, but our TAD is what we describe a capital TAD. And uh, so we, you know, essentially build and then we hand over the operations and maintenance of the Beltline to, to Parks and Rec uh, within the city of Atlanta, because this ultimately will be a city of Atlanta uh, asset after our organization, you know, goes away or moves on. Uh, the city of Atlanta will have, you know, full control and will be responsible for the operations and maintenance uh, of the Beltline. But that, that is one of the things that we're thinking through right now. What type of model makes sense outside of our funding uh, buckets? Because we get lots of dollars coming in to help us to plan, design, and construct the Beltline. But the dollars for literally the maintenance side of this uh, are on the, the city's role. And, and our Parks and Rec Department does a, a terrific job of, with the resources that they have uh, in front of them. But, uh, but this is gonna be a significant undertaking from a maintenance perspective. And so that's what the city is going through right now about how to you know, give a new infusion of revenue to Parks and Rec so that they can uh, keep the, the Beltline maintained uh, at a certain level, but but those are the conversations that uh, that we're having, uh, literally right uh, right now. Okay, I know that you have to leave. It's now one oh one. I'm going to turn this program over to Keith. And um, thank you, everyone. Clyde, thank you so much for being here today. We know you have a very important meeting uh, to attend to, but your presentation today has not only been informative but, but very inspirational. So thank you for sharing the success you've had there and your team. Uh, it's very inspirational to us and our public partners in the City of Memphis Parks and Neighborhoods Division, Shelby County, as we continue to look at our project and learn how it can better benefit our community. So thank you for being with us today. We know yeah, you have- yeah thank, yeah, thank you, Keith, to you and your entire team. Uh, so Kelsley and, and, uh, and others, thank you for, for again, just hosting us and and the more that we've learned about uh, uh, the conservancy there, we, you know, I, I have a, an affinity for what you all are doing as well. So continue to do the, the great job and, 
and uh, we look forward to being a partner with you in the future. Thank you. Thank you. Look right. forward to seeing you soon in the future. All For right, those gang. that are remaining, we will be concluding our program, but before we do, we want to Thank Lauren Taylor again and the Hyde Family Foundation for being part of today's program and all your support, Lauren. Uh, we want to remind you that we're very happy we've recently opened two important segments to the Wolf River Greenway, the uh, segment that goes through the Lucius Birch State Natural Area connecting to the, Wolf, to the Shelby Farms Green Line is now open. If you haven't been on that, you should visit it. We've also opened a leg that runs off of North McLean along the levee there in North Memphis. And so we continue to build out and grow the Wolf River Greenway, and we're excited about starting new construction next spring as well. Uh, look at wolfriver.org to learn about other activities. We've got service projects this weekend, and we will kick off the Wolf River Restoration Series in January with Martin Luther King Day of Service, and that runs through Earth Day 2022. So a lot going on at the Conservancy, very exciting. We can't do it without your support. Uh, remember, easy to donate to the Wolf River Conservancy through wolfriver.org, donate. Uh, and so we appreciate your support. We appreciate you being here today. Thank you so much.